Hey everyone, welcome to Ontario Tech Robot in 3 Days technical release. In this video, we're going to be going over some concepts of our robot and kind of dive into the challenges uh, that we experience over the course of our 3D build season. We are an RI3D team based out of Ontario Tech University in Oshawa, Ontario, and we have multiple partners such as First Robotics, ACE Climatic Wind Tunnel, the Faculty of Engineering Applied Science, as well as our very own engineering outreach team. We're going to start off so with in some introductions to our panel, so I'll pass it on to our mechanical team, followed by our control systems team, and then we'll dive into the more technical aspect of our robot. I'll start with Andy. Hi, I'm Andy Chan. I'm a fourth year mechatronics engineering student, and I was the senior lead for both design and mechanical this year, overseeing the build of this robot. Hello, my name is Mark Landry. I'm a second year mechatronics student. I am a junior <coughs> lead, helping out with design. Hi, I'm Kenneth Martinez. I'm second year mechatronic and I help with the design team as a junior lead. Hi, I'm Taya Vasiliu. I'm a second year mechanical engineering student and I'm a junior team lead for mechanical outreach and media. Hi everyone, I'm Cassie Campbell. I'm a first year electrical engineering student and I'm the junior electrical lead for RI3D. Hi everyone, my name is Tushar Patel. I am a fourth year mechatronics engineering student and I am the senior lead for the control side of things, uh, to overseeing both programming, electrical, and pneumatics. Right, so now that we've introduced our team, uh, we'll go a little bit more into perhaps the mechanical aspect. So Andy, do you want to start off? Yeah, so we'll start from the base of our robot and kind of work our way up into the different subsystems. So originally at the beginning of our three days, we uh, broke up into teams, looked at the game manual, and then proceeded to come up with a number of different concepts. Uh, of ways we could tackle this robot over the next three days. Um, through some basic prototyping, we ended up moving forward as soon as we could with the design we ended up choosing so that we could make as much progress on it as quickly as we could. Um, the whole of this robot is built, built off the uh, Kitbot chassis, which is in the log configuration with a drop center wheel. Um, most of that documentation can be found online to both assemble that get it uh, all together, make sure you have all the components, as well as uh, any support needed from a controls and software perspective as well. Uh, so on top of that, we actually have our elevator drivetrain, which both our uh, elevator, which is built on our drivetrain, uh, powered by two SIM motors. And I'll pass that on to Mark and Kenneth to kind of talk about it in depth, as they spent the majority of their time working on that, troubleshooting that, and uh, building it as well. Well, we base uh, our elevator on the Drifty single stage version. Well, we basically ended up with a short version of it that uh, reached until four feet of height. Uh, first, we 3D printed the bearing block part, uh, but of course, after testing, uh, it managed to break. Thus, we had to. Uh, make um, one out of metal to ensure that it doesn't cause any issues later on. Well, additionally, additionally we added some bases to attach the, the arm to the frame of the elevator and also some uh, parts for the pneumatic piston. Just adding on top of what those guys talked about as well, um, we were kind of restricted by the amount of aluminum we had available to us, so we decided to go with um, a more, you know, uh, we went with a more cascading elevator design over a carriage design, um, as we calculated the amount of, amount of material we had beforehand, and it was just enough to complete this design, and we probably wouldn't have had enough to go with the other one. Uh, moving on to our arm, uh, we had some pneumatics available and after looking at gearboxes and with the sim and mini sim motors we had, we thought it was best to go with a pneumatic drive on that arm as it could provide us more torque, uh, especially using a cylinder, we have a 40 mil bore cylinder, um, which at the maximum 60 psi could provide the amount of torque we need to lift that arm up and down and um, due to the length of that arm, it allowed us to score in all three positions on the grid. Um, that arm is 42 inches long um, and it is offset 8 inches into our frame perimeter. 
um, which is just at about the maximum reach of the robot. So when driving this robot with bumpers on, what you would do is to simplify your scoring at the top level, you would raise the elevator to a predefined location, lift the arm, and then drive until your bumpers hit that and you would be in your scoring position. That just simplifies the driving perspective of the challenge as when you're scoring, uh, it's not always easy to see in your driver's station exactly where you are. And the addition of cameras can help, but simplicity always wins over everything. Uh, moving on to our gripper, that's where we had the most trouble. Um, we kind of prototyped a number of different designs, but went with a simple geometry using six different compliant wheels which allowed us to grip the cone and the cube. We had worries early on that uh, because we only had one cube that we would have an issue if it popped and we wouldn't be able to continue our testing on it. So by using our compliant wheels, we kind of minimized uh, the effects of that. Um, so it's a simple claw design with uh, static wheels. So they don't rotate at all actually. Um, and by changing the amount of force we put on that gripper, we're able to pick up both the cone and ball very easily, or the cone and cube, sorry, very easily. And uh, yeah, um, another issue we had with that was uh, we attempted to use a 775 with a very large gear reduction on it to um, minimize the amount of, this was before we knew we were gonna be using the knives on this robot. And, um, we tried to run it and uh, we did have some issues with that gearbox. So after running some tests and realizing that that wouldn't work, we also moved to a pneumatic system on the gripper, um, which uses a cylinder that runs down the length of the arm, keeping our center of mass towards the middle rather than having a bulky system towards the end of the arm. And that allows us to very easily retract and uh, deploy the gripper to pick up the game objects. I think that's it from a mechanical <coughs> standpoint, so I'm going to pass it off to the control guys to talk about uh, their side of the robot. I'm going to be starting off with pneumatics. So for the pneumatic system, we used two cylinders in our design. Um, for the claw gripper, we used both low and high pressure for the cube and the cone respectively, sitting at 25 psi and 60 psi. The arm was actuated by a 40 millimeter bore piston, uh, which was used to lift the arm at the beginning of the match to extend past the height limit and the perimeter frame. Um, this optimized the height to pick up the game pieces from the human um, player loading station and to also reach the third level of the grid. With the elevator lowered, this would allow the piston to be retracted and be able to pick up the game pieces from floor level and instead of using the piston we would have been able to use a winch system which would allow full flexibility with the arm's angle. Moving on to electrical, we kept it pretty simple. As covered in our previous recap video, our drivetrain uses four SIM motors and four Victor SPX speed controllers. Uh, the only other mechanism that is driven by a motor is the elevator, which is driven by two SIM motors and two more Victor SPXs. We could have also used a motor for the arm, but we chose not to since we ran into some trouble with it, like Andy previously mentioned. <clears throat> so uh, from a programming perspective, we decided to go with a command-based framework over a time-based framework. Uh, this allowed us to more easily collaborate on the code itself, being able to make sure that we can integrate all of our code created by various programmers, uh, come together and bring it all into one piece. Um, we command the robot to actually be controlled using two controllers, both a driver and an operator. Uh, the driver themselves would be driving the actual drivetrain, while the operator would be controlling the arm itself, including raising and lowering the elevator, as well as uh, the actual arm itself, raising it up and down and closing the gripper. Uh, we would also utilize for driving, we would use a, a tank drive system. Um, the reason we went with tank drive is due to its more flexible controls as well as familiarity with our drivers. Um, the code itself for the claw allows the driver to interchange what item they're picking up, uh, what game object. So it could switch between the cone itself or picking up the cube. Uh, regulating using two different pressures. Uh, we were able to control which solenoid was activated and keep these controls consistent simply with a toggle change. And uh, that was a quick rundown of program. Cool. 
So let's say a rookie team was to go ahead and kind of mimic the design that we made in our robot. What might be some improvements that they can make on their end that will help them prepare better for the competition? Perhaps we'll start with mechanical. Yeah, so um, first of all, with the thrifty bot, um, we did make some minor modifications in the manufactured parts, which made them a lot easier to build. It helped us definitely in the three days that we had to build it, even though we did have access to a machine shop. We had a lot of parts that were a bit too complicated for what we wanted to do. So we did end up uh, simplifying, such as uh, the mounting of the chain onto the second stage of the elevator. Instead of uh, manufacturing a block for that to sit on, we ended up just bolting that to the second stage of the elevator with three M3 bolts. Um, looking mostly at our intake, we did mess around with that a bit, but there were, are definitely improvements to be made there in the geometry, the arm, and maybe the materials used. Uh, we did have good luck with the compliant wheels and they worked well, but there's definitely other materials that could be used there that might produce better results um, with testing. I'm sure we'll see many teams use a variety of different materials on that, as well as maybe even making that intake active. Uh, that's it from us. I don't know if Yes. So from a controls perspective, uh, variations that I would stress to a rookie team to add on would be towards adding uh, at least uh, some minimal sensors to especially aid with the first 15 seconds of the match in the autonomous period. Uh, it doesn't need to get too complicated. You can stick with simple ultrasonic sensors and proximity sensors to assist with picking up objects, so on and so forth. Uh, you could also integrate a webcam onto the robot. This would be very beneficial, especially when you are trying to retrieve an object from the other side of the field. Uh, the distance is really far away, so sometimes it wouldn't be easy to see with the naked eye. Rather than having the webcam integrated and being able to see it directly on your driver station would be greatly beneficial to actually working with this robot. A team could also explore the option of actually adding a motor to the arm rather than pneumatics and seeing if it is possible to create a higher gear ratio so, so that it functions without breaking. Um, they could also explore newer, uh, sorry, not newer, different motors um, such as NEOs for the drivetrain. This might increase speed, though they would have to compensate for it through higher weight in the bottom to prevent tipping. Uh, final note to add for a controls perspective uh, when it comes to driving is actually developing more of a driver interface, a better driver interface that allows you to detect various things such as initiating some sort of a signal to determine whether you are in toggle mode of a cube or a cone as well as some sort of a feedback to let the driver know that hey there is a uh, object within the claw. Awesome. Yeah, and I think another benefit of our design too is that we have a lot of parts that are fairly simply machined. So we have, you know, box tubing that's just simply cut to different lengths. We don't have any uh, necessarily intricate um, machine parts, perhaps besides the custom shape of the intake. However, in, you know, as a rookie team or depending on what kind of uh, machines you have access to, we can definitely make that a much simpler shape for your design. So I think it does give some flexibility and modularity, um, which is definitely a benefit for this kind of design. Thank you so much for tuning in to our technical release. I hope that this video was able to provide you a little bit of insight when designing your robots. And if you happen to have any more questions along the way, feel free to contact us on social media at OTRI3D or RI3D at OntarioTechU.net. Um, we'll respond to either of those platforms. Um, and yeah, thank you for tuning in and we hope you have a great build season.